Uh, good afternoon. Let me welcome you all to uh, Harvard Law School. My name is uh, Charles Ogletree. I'm the Jesse Kalinko Professor of Law here at Harvard and the founder and the executive director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. Uh, you are now in what I call uh, the Taj Mahal for students. Uh, it's commonly called Wasserstein uh, Hall, uh, and this is a brand new building that opened up a little bit more than a year ago. And it's, it's completely dedicated to students for classes, uh, seminars, events, uh, places to eat, uh, no faculty offices at all. Uh, it's five stories high, um, and there are four stories of parking below. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I know there are a few Harvard uh, alums, and I want to thank you very much for paying for this. Uh, you're making it possible. <laughs> because uh, we're having a good time. And I, I said that before I say the most important thing, that every event that we host here at, at Harvard, the Charles Hammond Houston Institute, and the one that we have uh, this summer on Martha's Vineyard, they're all free and open to the public uh, for the very reason. That's what Houston would have done. Uh, the whole idea is that exposing people to different points of view makes an enormous amount of difference, and that's what we're uh, trying to do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, say just a few words about uh, the event uh, tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, we are very fortunate to have this event co-sponsored by some very noteworthy individuals here uh, in this larger community. One is sitting in the front row, uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, the uh, director of the W.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard uh, and a remarkable professor, lecturer, and entrepreneur. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Uh, we're also, one of our co-sponsors is the Prison Studies Project, and I don't know if Kaya Stern is here. Uh, Kaya is a former staff person with the uh, Charles Hammond Houston Institute, uh, and she's done an incredible amount of work uh, uh, to make this a success, uh, and I wanted to thank her. Uh, and also, uh, uh, one of my former students, uh, uh, Gina Bond, I don't think she's here, but she was instrumental, uh, as you'll hear more about, in making sure that the, we could create this film. And I have to say, you'll hear from them uh, when, after we show the film. Uh, we have uh, two of the uh, young men who are part of the Central Park uh, Five, uh, and they have uh, endeavor to come to uh, Harvard Law School, and they'll be here uh, for the panel discussion. And they have every reason to be uh, disappointed in the American criminal justice system that treated them very badly for a very long time. Uh, but they're free, uh, and they're now uh, here. And you'll see them uh, in this remarkable film. Uh, there are uh, two people responsible for it, uh, and Ken Burns would want me to first thank his daughter, who not only wrote a wonderful book, but has played a, a central role in this. And she uh, uh, unfortunately can't be here, but uh, Professor Gates and I have hosted uh, a number of uh, events uh, with Ken Burns. He's, he is really the consummate uh, artist and producer who has an eye uh, for capturing things that have uh, addressed America and that uh, somehow, uh, this is my view, not his view, have an underline that has a lot to do with race, whether it's baseball, whether it's the Civil War, uh, whether it's this film, the Central Park Five, uh, it all has a tie-in to its great works that have some significance uh, in terms of what's happened with uh, race in America uh, in earlier centuries and what continues to happen, and did a phenomenal film as well. Uh, that we showed and screened uh, with Skip uh, several years ago, the Jack Johnson uh, documentary, which was really uh, amazing. Uh, and he is going to um, uh, be speaking uh, during uh, the discussion we're going to have. This is a two-hour film, so that's why we gave you some munchies to enjoy. This is at the movies. The lights are going to go down. You're going to be able to watch it. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, a brisk uh, discussion about uh, what the film's about. And since this room is already full, uh, we're going to actually start early. Some people will come in at 6 o'clock, you know, sorry for them. Uh, but we're going to start uh, early. Uh, but before we started, I wanted to uh, at least uh, have our producer and director and a friend of Harvard and a really a friend of public television come and say a word, if he would. I hope you would join me in welcoming to the stage, to this microphone, Ken Burns.
Thank you, Tree. We're very excited to be here. Um, I would advise you, of course, uh, to turn off your smartphones, particularly at Harvard University. I understand that can be risky to have an email going on. Um, <laughs> Got to be careful about these things. Um, we're, we're honored, and it's really three people who made this film. Uh, my daughter, Sarah, who, who first um, became, I, I guess the word is obsessed with this story. Um, I had been familiar with it, but had not, it had taken Sarah's awakening before I got involved. And her husband, my son-in-law, David McMahon, the three of us are the co-directors, the co-producers, and the co-writers of this. So if you don't like anything, we're entirely uh, to blame. And since the two of them are not here, it looks like I'm entirely to blame. Um, but we, Tree is right, we've, uh, you know, I've been interested in American history all of my professional life as a filmmaker not as a historian, um, but I have been drawn to a kind of honest, complicated version of the past. And with the exception of only two or three films that I can think of that I've worked on out of the 26, 27 that we've made for public broadcasting over the last 35 years, only two or three don't deal in some large way with race. And it's not because we go looking for it, it's because it's there in American life. Um, we know when we were founded, we know what our creed was, the second sentence of the Declaration, that says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But it's sort of funny uh, that the guy who wrote that owned more than 100 human beings when he wrote it, and he didn't see the contradiction. And so we have an American narrative that is constantly trying to attend uh, to a question of race at all times. I mean, our greatest event, the Civil War, wouldn't have happened uh, without that. I mean, all, uh, the only art form we've created, jazz, is uh, you know born in a community that had the peculiar experience of being unfree in a free land. So wherever you go, it's the thing that we need to deal with always. Uh, and I don't need to tell my friends and distinguished uh, colleagues here or any of you in this audience uh, about the centrality of race in American life uh, today, yesterday, and tomorrow. So this film, uh, my daughter was an undergraduate at a uh, s small college in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, <laughs> and she, between her junior and senior year, ended up as an unpaid intern at a uh, law firm, a civil rights law firm in New York City uh, that was preparing a civil suit against the city of New York for the wrongful conviction and imprisonment of the so-called Central Park Five. Uh, she was fascinated with the case, obsessed with it, wrote her final paper her senior year on the representations of race in the media coverage of it, and then went to work for this law firm af as a paralegal after a college, didn't want to be a lawyer, left uh, that, but the case continued to haunt her, and she eventually decided to write a book. As she was writing that book, uh, her husband David and I had the great privilege of sort of watching the first pages come out and looked at each other and said, my goodness, this is an extraordinary film as well, and, and in a way, a way not to duplicate the book, but to actually do something different. So we started on parallel tracks a little bit behind her. Her book was published in the spring of 2011. We finished in the spring of 2012, and uh, we started with the uh, uh, Cannes Film Festival last May and thought, well, we'll just go to a couple film festivals and that'll be it. And we're now playing in 110 cities, uh, venues, and it will be broadcast. <laughs> Thank you. It, it will be broadcast uh, on April 16th. So after you weep uh, for your taxes, you can weep for uh, this story the, the next night if, if you uh, want to see it again or want to tell folks about it. But I'm thrilled that we have an opportunity here. Sarah liked to say that when she learned about this story, um, as someone too young to remember the actual events of April 19th, uh, 1989, uh, she was outraged and uh, she still feels outraged. And I think that we joined her in her outrage and we still feel outraged. And it's impossible as everyone does before a film to say, I hope you enjoy it uh, because you will not enjoy it. Uh, I hope you to share and absorb our outrage. One thing that will help, which I'm very pleased to say is that we will have uh, two of the five uh, Raymond Santana and Kevin Richardson, who will be here uh, afterwards uh, to join in the question. And you will find them 
two human beings who will be able to absorb a lot of that outrage and perhaps channel it into something positive and productive and, and forward moving. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we really appreciate you skipping your dinner hour uh, to watch the film. And I look forward to the conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks your, uh, to your daughter and your son-in-law. And as well, uh, we want to thank Kevin Richardson and Raymond Santana, uh, who are, will be here for it. We actually have uh, an overflow room as well. Some of you who are standing, uh, it's, uh, if you go outside and go up two uh, stories, take the elevator, it's room 3018, 3018. It's comfortable, and you can see the whole film, uh, and uh, we want to make sure that everyone's uh, able to uh, enjoy it. Uh, and we hope that you will uh, watch and enjoy it with uh, relish uh, and uh, welcome, as they should be welcome, uh, with Ken and the uh, young men when they come in after the film showing. So relax uh, and uh, turn your cell phones off and let's enjoy, uh, to the extent we can, learn from uh, the Central Park Five. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could I introduce Kevin Richardson and Raymond Santana? Thank you all for uh, recognizing these extraordinary uh, individuals and, and Ken and his daughter and son-in-law for making really a classic uh, film that will be with us for a very, very long time. Uh, I, we're going to uh, take some questions from the uh, audience and uh, I should announce those in 3018, please come downstairs if you want to uh, ask a question so we can see you, those in the overflow room. Uh, I know the seats are gone, but you can feel around the walls. Uh, there's a microphone to the left and a microphone to the right, uh, halfway down the stage. Uh, it might make sense for folks to get in line now. Uh, and this is going to be a 40-minute uh, uh, or so dialogue uh, with our, our guest tonight. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Ken to just say a little bit why uh, his daughter and son-in-law made the film and what does he think its arc is, what is it supposed to do, Ken? Well, I, I think we set out to try to answer two questions. How could something like this happen? And who were these five? That is to say, uh, if you were the Central Park Five in 1989, you were the worst human beings on Earth. And somehow, as people forgot it, by the time of their exoneration, they became something in limbo. Most people thought they got off on a technicality if they knew that at all. And for the last 10 years, as the city has outrageously delayed this, this is a great city. This is a great progressive city that has behaved uh, using the language of the Jim Crow South now, uh, a century before, uh, to prolong this trial, to keep things going. And um, we, the second question was, who are they? Who, who are these five people? Because they had their humanity taken away, and we've tried to, in the film, sort of ask that question in every breath. Who are we? At the same time, it, as we were talking earlier, it's the most rigorously journalistic film we've ever made. It's relatively contemporary. There's no narration deliberately to devoid ourselves and the film of any kind of colorful language. The few adjectives are all related to the brutal rape of Trisha Miley and her extraordinary recovery. Everything is just the facts. And though the cops and the prosecutors hid behind the skirts of the civil suit and did not ask, did not respond to our repeated, every six months I would call them to ask to comment for our film, our film will be better if you're in it. Uh, they refused knowing full well they could not answer any of the basic questions we would have to ask them and hid instead behind the skirts of that thing. But we nevertheless, nonetheless, tried our best to represent their side in this. So, you know, we've, uh, we yield to the extraordinary humanity of these 
uh, five men, and we've gotten who we've gotten to know is the great privilege of our life. But we also know that film is a powerful tool, and we hope that in some ways, whatever happens with this film, and there'll be a national PBS broadcast on the 16th, that we might have an ability to affect something, or at least exert the kind of pressure on the city, so that somebody wakes up and says, remind me again why we're protecting people who screwed up 24 years ago? and that they can move towards settlement. We have no vested interest in what that settlement is. We only know that it is good for the five, it is good for their families, it's actually good for the prosecutors and police in a kind of truth and reconciliation way, and it's good for the city of New York and the citizens of this world if you put a period at the end of this run-on sentence and say, oh, no mas, it's over, it's over, let's, let's put it behind us and, and go forward rather than in the suspended animation that they are still forced to live their lives. And let me just say this uh, in terms of uh, Raymond and Kevin, who represent two of the five uh, uh, who are here uh, tonight. I know that the city of New York, the prosecutors, the police have yet to say they apologize for what happened. Right. I apologize for this happening in America to both of you and the other three as well. It just is indefensible. There are a lot of questions that will be asked. I'm going to ask you first, uh, it, it, everyone's going to ask, how do you feel? But what's the reaction to 1989 and now it's 2013? What's your reaction? First start with Raymond and Kevin. <clears throat> first off, um, I just want to thank everybody for having us out. It's, it's an honor to be here today. Um, it's an honor to uh, sit here in front of you and, and try to put our lives back together. Um, you know, it's, it, we have so much emotion when it comes to those questions, you know, because there's, you know, Reyes didn't have to come forward. He could have kept this, this story to himself and, and we would have still been registered sex offenders. We, we probably wouldn't have had no jobs. My daughter probably wouldn't have been born. I probably would have still been tangled up somewhere in the system. Um, but it's just about being grateful, you know, being grateful, given the opportunity, given the chance you know, to try and pick up the pieces and, and to move forward and, and, and to put our lives back together, um, even though we still have to walk on eggshells and, and uh, you know, we still have to deal with this litigation that's been pending for 10 years and, 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 and nobody wants to take responsibility for what happened to us. Um, and at the end of the day, we just have to be grateful that we're here, you know, to be in front of you and, and to receive the response that we received that you guys gave us, you know, today. And the other screen is because it, it becomes part of our healing process. You know, it, it's so awesome when we come in front of you and, and, the, and the love that you give us. You know, because back in 1989, like Ken said, we was considered the worst. And, and now, you know, uh, to be given an opportunity to come before you and, and get the hugs and, 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 and to, to feel the love, it, it, it's, it's like that beginning of that indelible scar, that deep scar is that beginning of the healing for us. It's interesting, Kevin, I want you to respond as well, that, that even after you were exonerated and released, the people still, the press was still saying the guilty five. It, it, it didn't end. Kevin, what's your sense about having to live this at now, uh, more than 20, 20, almost 24 years after it happened? First of all, hello, everyone. <clears throat> you know, uh, it's extremely difficult to still go through this after it's plain to see that we're innocent and evidence shows that, it goes to show you that um, when Jim Jawaiya says that people are still stuck in a lie, they're still stuck in a mistake. And I had a deposition last week that I did and I actually told the people that was uh, interviewing me, I told them, I don't know how can you sleep at night knowing that you took or attempted to take people's lives away a lot of our family members passed away from this. And I'm just asking that question, they couldn't answer that. And you know, we're still dealing with this now. One thing by us being here speaking to you is, is extremely therapeutic for us. Because in 89, we didn't have a voice. We were too scared to speak because we thought the world was against us. You know, so to be here now in front of you and people to see us and to see that we're human, we're human beings. We have families, we have kids, we're just trying to move on in society. So for this just to still be going on now is, it goes to show you people's character. 
you know. And another thing is uh, people wonder why they ask us, are we bitter? We're not, we're not bitter because we believe that bitterness will take you to the grave. Mm -hmm. What we do now, like we were doing at this point, is reversing that and speaking with intellect and showing you that we're not animals because they want us to go the other way. So I just wanted to tell you that we are extremely thankful to be here. Thank you very much. There are microphones on the both sides of the room and to ask folks to come forward and ask their questions and, and try to be as precise uh, and as brief, as Skip would say, as you can uh, in your question. First question. Well, this is all it's very, on. This is very overwhelmingly uh, uh, moving and uh, it's just wonderful to have you two here. And it says something about the power of the film as a medium because if I had read this in a newspaper, even though I'm a reasonably smart guy, I'm not sure I'd feel the same way about it as, as you do seeing it on a film and seeing you appear there. So it's incredible. I have just one question. I think of Mayor Bloomberg as being a very fair-minded, very smart person. And if he gives a shit so much about a 17-inch sugary soft drink, <laughs> I would think that he would look, if he saw this film, he would be absolutely outraged. And has he seen it? We, we, we've tried to get it to him. We don't believe that he's seen it. We offered it to Ed Koch, who said, I know how to go to the theater. And somebody said, Ed Koch just saw the film. He was yeah. at one, weren't you at one of the screenings? Yeah. Yes. And Ed Koch was there. And then he wrote a review, which was essentially positive, but still said, I don't think the cops did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Said it was a great film. Everybody should look at it, but the cops didn't do anything wrong. I agree with you. Bloomberg's a manager. This is an incredible drain. The comptroller of the city of New York has already spoken out in a, in a press conference saying, why are we spending money for 10 years prosecuting something, uh, you know, delaying something and continuing to deny uh, justice to them? And most recently, the city council passed a non-binding resolution saying, let's put this past, let's settle this. And the Corporation Council steadfastly refuses to, has been obstinate, and has been fighting with their own fellow you know, city workers over this. I don't know whether it's the DIN has reached up to Bloomberg, but I, one would hope that he would be reasonable enough to see this. I, I think your film will create that DIN. Uh, let's hope so. Any other reactions? Um, really quick. Um, uh, you know, Bloomberg wasn't in office back then, and, and, and so was it, uh, Commissioner Kelly, and that's one thing that we, we struggle to understand why is it that if you're not in the office, I mean, it, it, it's not a, it, uh, it doesn't take away, you know, anything from you to, to, to acknowledge that somebody did something wrong, you know, and, and it makes you even look more heroic in the eyes of the people to say, you know what, I'm going to step up and I'm going to be the leader and I'm going to make sure that we correct this wrong. And so that's one thing that we, you know, we struggle with, you know, to come across numerous senators and and councilmen, and we receive proclamations from the city on a, on a, on a uh, city, on a, uh, from the council members and also from the state senate. And to still sit here and be fighting this legal battle 10 years later is mind boggling. Another question, another question from the audience? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my uh, name is Susie. Um, I'm also struggling with being overwhelmed. At some point during the film, I realized that I was 15 in 1989, also in New York, but in a very different place um, on Long Island and with quite a bit of privilege. Um, but my question doesn't have to, have to do with my being overwhelmed, but it just is an excuse for the reason that my voice is shaky. Um, I'd like to know just basically if you could tell me the, more about the civil suit, you know, so exactly, you know, what uh, the nature of the suit is, where the suit is right now, what you're able to share, um, and also if there's any kind of public support campaign um, that's following the suit. Well, basically the civil suit right now is, um, we're still in discovery, we're still doing depositions. Uh, they have conducted over 50 depositions and they still have some ways to go. Um, but what happens is that the city tends to use these stall tactics against us. You know, we was just uh, recently uh, they was debating a, on the um, on the disc. You know, we was trying to get the files from the police officers, and it took about three months of them to debate on how they can 
uh, transfer that information to uh, up to date this and how much was the cost and and that took about three months to debate that um, so it's stuff like that that we we came across there's also the waivers they send you the stack of waivers and they ask you to, to sign off to look into your history um, and so for us it was prison records it was school records Facebook uh, Twitter um, anytime we went to the doctor for our family members for my dad they went back 25 years and they looked at has he ever been on disability uh, has he ever took workman's comp? Um, how many doctors has he seen in the last 25 years? And he had to sign off on waivers to get all those records. Stuff that has no bearing on the case, but this is just part of the stall tactic. And then, you know, the recent one was when they subpoenaed Ken, Sarah, and Dave for the outtakes of the film. Um, and, so, and that's stuff we had to deal with all this time. We just spent $100,000 um, in legal fees fighting that subpoena, we, which we got quashed by a federal magistrate who severely rebuked the Corporation Council for their arguments. The city has now come back and sort of appealed, go, dropping all of those arguments and now trying a whole new set of them. And the idea is to wear us down, and I'm in the strange position of having to start a legal defense fund uh, because we refuse to give up our, our notes and outtakes uh, on this film. And so when you ask about what can be done, um, since you're not in New York right now, I assume, um, people have been coming out to the various hearings, and, and you can find that on the, on the Facebook pages and the, uh, and the site. There's a Central Park Five uh, website and Facebook page, and each of the individual uh, five have their own Facebook page. You can find out particular dates if you happen to be in the city. But referring to the last question, you can write the mayor of the city of New York, an old-fashioned snail mail, and all of a sudden, there will be a critical mass. There will be a critical mass. You know, the President of the United States is going to look at this film shortly, ask to see it. And so, you know, let's, you know I, I'm not sure that pressure can be exerted, but I think at some point, a critical mass of people seeing that the emperor has no clothes, finally, protecting these detectives, many of whom have retired. Some are still in the force. Protecting these officers, same thing. Protecting these prosecutors, same thing. It just, it's a fool's errand. It's a fool's errand, and, and they've delayed too long. This is outrageous when detectives who are supposed to keep their records suddenly can't find them, but they expect Raymond's dad to have his 25 years of stuff. Otherwise, this is 10 years old, 10 years old. It's outrageous. There's, uh, Ken, you also Thank said you. there's a lot of things that the police could have done and didn't do if they were really looking for the person's uh, well, person responsible. Well, I, I'm not sure. This is a very dense film, and it does sort of kick you in the gut. It's so hard to take, which is why you don't say, as everyone hopes that you'll enjoy their film, and we don't hope you enjoy this film. I don't know what, what kind of person you would be. It's a bizarre film in which the only person who has a conscience uh, is, the, is a psychopathic racist, uh, a rapist who decides to confess and apologize and and uh, otherwise these guys would 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 be in there um, it, it's just it's so hard to fathom the exact extent of what what's going on mm -hmm. with them and their lives and with us at now having done this film and I'm sorry I forgot the meat of your question. just trying to figure out from from your point of view why this was so important what do you see as some of the errors that they made in the case oh that, yeah uh, well I mean there's <laughs> They, sure the, the, the biggest thing That's is, right. if you notice in the film, the, the attack of Trisha Miley occurs uh, on, on April 19th. But you notice later on, about halfway through the film, you meet Mateus Reyes, and you find out that on April 17th, two days before, he assaulted a woman. They were interrupted. She got away, was able to give a description. He had a cut on his cheek. The de young detective did some work with the hospitals and identified him, and they didn't do anything. Linda Fairstein very quickly closed that case. The woman who is assaulted moved to the West Coast. And we think that in some ways, and the New York Times is now pursuing a Freedom of Information Act request from the city for more information about documents that have just disappeared about this case, about that earlier case, that a lot of this is in reaction to that screw up. So that they're more willing to sacrifice human lives to cover up the cover up than they are to exactly let the light of day in. So it was very interesting. At the time of the reinvestigation, evidence from April 17th mysteriously disappeared. 
and reappeared after uh, Morgenthau's uh, commissioned report by two other independent uh, prosecutors came forward. And so I think there's enough that stinks in that that we're ready to dive back in and say, let's, let's, let's make another film about what happened on April 17th, see if we can find this woman. And maybe at some, at some point they'll realize that this thing is, you know, it's like a Watergate. Uh, the, so that's that. The first mistake is they had him, right? And they didn't get him. Right? Second mistake is, after you spend 30 hours with a 14-year-old and he finally has got a story and it contradicts all the other stories and their internal contradictions, wouldn't you at least as a professional entertain another theory? You could still believe these guys are, are, are wrong, but you would, out of professionalism, uh, pursue alternative theories. When the DNA comes back and there's no match, this is a bloody, bloody crime scene. They catch uh, Raymond and Kevin that night. They're not, they don't have any time to change their clothes. Is there, is there blood on them? Not a bit. Nothing of the crime scene on them, nothing of them on the crime scene. No DNA match, inconsistencies in the confession, bad legal representation. They're, they're desperate to solve this. They know they've made a mistake. The trains left the station, and the truth, they all realize. You know what? Film, somebody was talking about the power of film earlier, the first question. Film has a kind of polygraphic force to it, you know? You, you, you've met these five people, you know who they are now, as, we've, as we know who they are. But you also know the police and prosecutors. They may not have given us that, but you see uh, Elizabeth Letterer's face when she won? How happy does she look? She looks miserable. I think I need a vacation. I think I'm gonna give it to her, Robert Morgenthau says. You know, she looks miserable. She knows. She's still a prosecutor. Fairstein retired and uh, has been, is a celebrated uh, crime novelist. She did the preppy murder case in this and on the basis of this. But when you heard the story of Michael Armstrong, who was hired by the police to reinvestigate and found that the police hired somebody who found that the police did nothing wrong, except let the you know, guy go, her husband worked in the law firm of the guy who did the investigation. And Morgenthau has broken with her and, and her husband has since passed away. I mean, it's a very, very complicated um, Shakespearean house, you know, that's, that's going on there. And so she's out there uh, telling us that she won't talk to us, but goes on to Fox and says, we don't have all the facts. This is before we're done with our film. And all we wanted to say was, if we don't have the facts, please tell us what the facts are, Linda. But she, she couldn't do that because, as I said before, she couldn't answer one question that we would ask her. I just wanted to state, uh, basically there, they never expected the truth to come out. They expected us to still be in prison right now. And when it did, they don't know what to do. They're trying to hide behind their mistakes, but it's out now. And we must do everything possible, like we're doing now, we use this as a platform to raise awareness to people. So it won't be another Century Park Five it won't be, you know, another Scotts Brothers Boys. It won't be other things happening. So we use this as a platform to get this out. You know, I just wanted to state that. Let me ask you about the the community that you know maybe heard on uh, television or read a newspaper who still think that something happened, still think you're involved. What, what's your reaction to that, and how do you respond to folks who still don't get the fact that you guys didn't commit the crime? I mean, I mean, since the film has came out, um, that number has uh, reduced <laughs> drastically. <laughs> um, I mean, I came from a big family, you know, five uncles on one side, three on another, and they all thought I was guilty. Um, and at the end of the day, the only person I had in my corner was my father. Um, but, we, you know, we understand that time heals all wounds. And I, and I always use this as my example because, you know, they came forward and they apologized. And, you know, like Kev said, to stay bitter will take you to the grave, it will eat you from the inside out, and I accept the apology. Um, because I understand that, you know, we get numerous apologies when we go out and we speak at events, and we accept those apologies because we understand that at the end of the day, you were fed a false story, you know? And so, you know, you, were, you, was, you, know, you was misled, and we can't hold that against you, you know? We have to accept, you know, what happened to you also, you know, so. Yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not mad at the public because in 89, there was such a media frenzy. If you lived in New York, actually it was worldwide, but if you lived in New York, you would see what kind of frenzy it was. And at the, at the time, people really didn't use logic. 
if we just took a step back and say, there are too many inconsistencies in this case. It doesn't make sense, but they didn't do that. But we don't blame anybody. Oh, we don't blame the public. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that concerned me was that uh, a year ago, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who many people are talking about the sugary sodas, but other things, he supported the idea of what uh, has legally been called a stop and frisk, which was really a stop on site policy in Brooklyn, stopping people not because they've committed a crime, not because they have a weapon, because they're black or brown and walking on the street. Uh, and, and my sense is that what do you say to a young person now who experienced what happened and what you, happened to you, can you tell them, all right, brother, hang on, uh, justice will prevail, when they are 14, 15, 16, they may be in jail for decades, no one knows that they're innocent. Yeah, you know, the first thing that we always do is we talk to the parents because we know that the parents is that first line. When that kid comes, you know, when he grows up, that's, that's the first role model that you come across. And we always tell the parents, you know, to know your rights as a parent, you know, and to be able to tell the kid what to do. You know, no police policy, no police procedure. Be the first person to tell the kid, you know, what to do when he stopped. Because Central Part 5 led to stop and frisk. Stop and frisk led to Trayvon Martin um, and, and numerous other cases. You know, you know, it, it, you know uh, and by us, you know, telling the parents that, then we ask the parents to use us, use our story as an example, that, that positive reinforcement of what can happen to a kid who doesn't know his rights. Because we're not the only case, you know, it happens all the time. In Chicago, you have the Inglewood Four, you know. And so, you know, this is a situation that we always encourage the parents. And, and, and there's another aspect to this too, which is um, they turned on the videotape cameras after 30 hours. Um, and even Ray Kelly, who's the current commissioner of police in the city of New York, has suggested that, you know, maybe you should be turning on the cameras the second the interrogation begins. And just think what would have happened if that jury, that lone jury member, member holding out at those inconsistencies and, and wanting to go home as they all wanted to go home and capitulating, um, made up some cockamamie story to get out of there. What if they were all privileged to the good cop, bad cop, to the lying, to the deceit, to the, you know, we know you didn't do it, you're a good kid, Raymond, but there's uh, this other guy, Kevin, who's saying you did it, and he's saying, I've never, I don't know who Kevin is. And all of a sudden, uh, you, it's a circular firing squad. What if the jury could see all of that? Um, we, 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 we still want, apparently, we want our police to have the power to lie and to suggest and coax things out if they're guilty. But we also want to be able to build into the system the, um, the ability for the jury of the peers to see the manipulation and understand the consistencies. And, you know, uh, Youssef's uh, attorney was a divorce lawyer. Uh, with the exception of Mickey Joseph, Michael Joseph, who was a court assigned lawyer, nobody had, Antron had the only really effective legal representation and even he could not climb the mountain against the sort of the overwhelming public sentiment that they had to be guilty even though all these inconsistencies existed because they confessed and because the police and the prosecutor said it was so. A question from over here? Yep. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martha Hodes. Uh, I'm a New Yorker, and I was in New York at the time. And I just want to express my gratitude to everybody up there, gentlemen. Um, it's really, uh, I, I can't find words to express seeing you here. I'm a historian of, of race and sexuality. And for me, this case is, and, and was at the time as well, all about race and sexuality. And it was in the film, absolutely in the film. For me, as a, as a scholar of that, uh, of, of of those kinds of issues. It was somewhat understated, but maybe for that reason more powerful. So my question is, um, for you gentlemen, at the time, did people talk about this? This was a white woman, you're men of color, this is what it's going to be about. Was that something that was discussed? Was it said? And then my question for the filmmaker or, or all of you, now do, do white people want to talk about this? Are they willing to say this? Are they willing to say that's what this case was about? Um, I know for, for, for us, because we was, you know, for me, I, I spent 17 months in the juvenile facility, and it wasn't talked about in that aspect of a political aspect or even a historic aspect. It was mostly just about your uh, your guilty. A lot of people assumed that we were guilty, and so you didn't get a lot of "let me talk to you," you know, "let me uh, rub your shoulders and make sure you're all right." You didn't get a lot of that. You got mostly like, "Oh, you're Raymond Santana. Stay over there, please." You know, and, and you know, that's something that Kevin spoke about earlier, like 
we felt like we was alone, you know? So even, even um, if there was some type of uh, uh, rehabilitation in here somewhere, we wasn't gonna get that. It wasn't about that for us. It was just about punishment. You know, I think it, that's a really uh, excellent question, and it, it, it sort of it felt like it opened the door on the editing process for us because we did make a decision to sort of consciously understate that um, for the purposes of not sort of adding overlays of sort of interpretation and other contexts that may not have actually been as operative as we think, you know. Um, and, and, and it's very complicated because it's resonating off those historical and political contexts. And, and yet, in the end, it may be what Dwyer said. They got stuck in a mistake. And we've all in this room made a mistake. And we all know probably in this room what it's like to hang on to that mistake and rather than tell the truth, hang on a little bit longer. And we know the discomfort and the internal turmoil that causes uh, as well as its external damages. And I think that, of course, it's about race, you know, and of course, this was a moment in which race trumped rape in a way because this was a rape case. And if they'd followed the clues of the rape case, they perhaps would have come to an earlier conclusion. They might have gotten and connected Reyes to this event, uh, but they didn't because one might assume, and, and, and this is where, why we wanted to tread lightly about this. As Saul Kasson, the social psychologist, says in the film, it's not unreasonable to think, he says, that these guys might have done it the night of the thing. You've got all these reports coming out of the central of part of Central Park of these this gang of kids that are hassling bicyclists and doing this and hassling joggers and have 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 beat up somebody seriously enough to be a felony. And then You've rounded up a few kids, not just uh, Kevin and Raymond, but you've rounded up a lot of other kids, and you eventually go out over the next day or so, and you bring in other kids, including Corey and Yusef and Antron. And because they are innocent and uh, from good families and never been in the system before, are trying to be cooperative, they're in the most trouble. They're in the most jeopardy. And the cops begin to work on them, and all of a sudden it's not so much race and sexuality, it's, it's informed, of course, historically by all of the things of, of Gone with the Wind and Birth of a Nation, white women and, and black men. Um, but it's also then becomes, we can make these guys for it. That's a different sort of thing. When Jim Dwyer says they're in the lanes high-fiving each other, they're not going, we got a bunch of black guys. They're just happy that they're now going to have another notch on their gun. They've got another thing that they've, that they've done. The thing where race comes in for me is where they realize somewhere along the line, every single one of them, that they made a mistake. And each one of them said, somewhere, it doesn't matter, they're just a bunch of black kids. That's what happened. That's what happened. And they, could, they would rather let these guys rot in jail than to say, you know what, I screwed up. I think, I think Captain, I think Commissioner, I think Mr. Mayor, we gotta open this thing up again, this stinks. I'm upset. Nobody did that because it's just a bunch of black guys. Question over to the left. Uh, thank you, my name is Jason Leiden. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for being here. And I'm actually having a really hard time with that last statement. I, I, th that would, this would not have happened to me uh, nope. as a white man, as a young white man who grew up in the suburbs. What happened to you would not have happened. West me, Memphis. Period. Sure. So in terms of how, what I'm curious about for you all is that one of the things that's so powerful about this film is that you are innocent. Uh, one of the things that's so powerful is that people are going to say this shouldn't have happened to you. But this shouldn't happen to anybody. Um, and so how for you all, in terms of thinking about how this impacts the criminal injustice system, goes after and destroys the lives of young black and brown men every day all the time, how can this keep getting sympathy uh, with your innocence, this, such an important aspect of the story, trickle into the fact that our police, this is what they do. And the Boston Herald does what those newspapers did every day. Mm -hmm. um, that there's nothing new about what happened. It hasn't gone away. So how do you see this playing into and shaping, hopefully, a an even larger conversation that Great the question. beauty and power of your innocence and also that this is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the first thing that we do is we come out and we come into venues like this and you get people to start discussing and, and put together discussion and somebody comes up with a solution. 
That's number one. So, you know, it's starting in the beginning. You know, we don't have all the answers, but we have to do our part. And everybody just does their part. We can move a whole lot faster. And so this is what we do. That's one thing. And then the second uh, part to it was that we knew that because in 1989, we were 14 and 15 and 16. year old Corey was 16. And nobody wanted to invest in us. Everybody just threw us away. And so we decided to invest our time into the kids. And so we started, we, we teamed up with the Innocence Project. And we went out to, we go to high schools, we go to colleges, and we talk. And we talk. And, 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 um, and at first, we, we thought it was going to be, you know, we didn't know it was going to work because to have 200 kids in the room, you know, with a film, and you know, they're probably going to get bored, want to go to the bathroom, start talking, throwing paper. And when, it, and, and when, it's, when, the, lights, when the lights go off, nobody moves. And right there, we knew this is it. This is what we got to do. And so we just do our part at the end of the day. And that's all we can do. You know, if, if, uh, if us going out and talk saves a, another Trayvon Martin, hey, I'm happy with that. I did my job. Yeah. Yes. We believe that we, we have a calling to do this. You know, it's, it's funny. Before I met Ken, Sarah, and Dave, I'm 38 right now. I really didn't know my point in life, actually, you know, because it was taken away from me. And this gave all of us the platform to do so. I was very shy. I'm still a little reserved. But um, I was, you know, now I feel, you know, God is talking to me that I have to do this. You know, my, my mother always told me that the truth will come out, you know. So it's only right to be physically used in any way to make this better. Like Ray said, it starts right here, and we need the power of the people to, um, to keep this thing going. Question over to the uh, right. My question is as follows. A great relief that you're out and able to be here today. It's a wonderful thing. There are many who are not. One uh, whom I think actually is not even African American is Sonia Peltier, who has been in prison for decades, and since 1984, at least the FBI admits fully they have nothing on him, but he's there for what he stands for. I'm wondering uh, if uh, the panel can address what we can do to begin to change our criminal justice system so that it stops holding up specific individuals as symbols and keeping them in prison, even political prisoners in this country, uh, so that we can change what can we in this room do to change this so that this country starts going in a different direction. Uh, that's about as old as, you know, 1619 and the Declaration of Independence. You know, we're going to, it's going to take a lot more than this panel uh, to move that ship around. I think it, it, it's incremental. Each of us has a role to play. Each of us has um, talents that we can devote to that. I mean, certainly I'm, I'm looking at my friend Skip Gates, who spent most of his professional life uh, in the service of your question. Um, I'm, I'm, sitting at a panel with my friend who has done the same thing. Uh, many of you in this room are so dedicated. Uh, obviously, you see the transformation that's taken place in not only Kevin and, and Raymond, but me. And I can tell you it's Sarah and Dave as well. And how much this film, we're supposed to be working on another film uh, right now, the three of us, and we can't. This is demanded of us. And there are educational, specific educational things that we've all brought up tonight that can be done, and these are the incremental steps. But what you have to have is a sort of large scale. It's, 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 it's every single question that's been asked tonight has as part of it, what can I do? It, sometimes it's framed in a more political way, as yours was, but I, I think it really has to come back to you. What will I now do, coming off two hours of time spent unpleasantly? Um, what will I now do? How will I act? How will I conduct myself? Will I actually write that letter? Yeah, yeah, oh, sure, that's a good idea, Ken. But who, you know, if 10% write that letter, that's unbelievable. But isn't it unbelievable that 90% said, yeah, I'll write a letter to Mayor Bloomberg, but didn't? And so a lot of us spend a good deal of our lives in that kind of acquiescence to, to what is. And you know what, I'm so proud of my daughter, and maybe before I cry, uh, Raymond and Kevin can talk about the fact that nobody had ever cared or listened to them until Sarah came along. And you know, they weren't going to do something for just about anybody. Yeah, yeah I mean, so, you know, we, um, we, 
we're always grateful to Sarah at the end of the day because this was a woman who was on her way to law school. We didn't even know who her father was. I was like, who's Ken Burns? I don't, I mean, they was like, here, watch a couple of movies. And I'm like, all right, I'll watch Jack Johnson. Um, <laughs> you know, but we know. Which, which was called Unforgivable Blackness, That's may I that say. Was, yeah. That was the first movie I saw. And, but this was a woman who, who put her career on the line for us. And when a person steps out, I mean, like Ken said, if more people would do that, you know, then things would get done a whole lot faster and we could move to a better place. Um, and we felt that if she was gonna do that and put herself out there, we had to do it double, you know? And, and even to this day, like we're still going around and, and she, well, she just texted me today and said, are we doing Yale tomorrow? And, <laughs> and, um, and I'm like, I'm tired, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> guys had me since September running around. So, but, but when a person steps up like that, you have to answer. You know, and, and I think that's also a reason why, you know, the, the four of us, even Antron, you know, when he can, he steps up and, and he comes out and, and because it's just that powerful. You, you know, these guys all have PTSD, yeah. right? Can we understand that? They all have PTSD. And in some ways, Antron, we were talking about this the other night in Harlem. We showed at a Harlem theater called Mist and, and we had a really good crowd. Of, it was an association of, of New York State black journalists. and. You know, this is also a story about PTSD, to add the layers to the excellent question that was asked about race, about sexuality, all of that. These guys have suffered from that. Imagine, my mother died when I was 11. Uh, it's something that has haunted me and informed every aspect of who I am. This event is the same sort of being ripped out. And Antron has left, you know, he changed his name. He lives uh, in the South. He's got a job as a forklift operator. He's come up once, and that was for the end of the Doc NYC uh, Film Festival, and ran right back, and we've been unable to pry him out, and we think we've lured him back to a mid-April, the night after the national broadcast that New York Times is doing a Times talk at their, at their uh, auditorium uh, in New York City, and, and uh, Antron is gonna come up. And, uh, and be with us. But you know, he goes through every moment of every day waiting for somebody, that hand to come on his shoulder and say, Antron McRae, come this way. And in a kind of Kafka-esque, Orwellian, you know, end of life, that's what happens. And I think what the four who have remained in New York in varying degrees of success, Corey really struggles, but uh, Raymond and Kevin and Youssef have really helped transform what's happened to them into something positive. And so for those of us with abstract questions, let's move them from the abstract into the real and, and try to do actually do something. That's a really important thing. And, and just let me say for the audience, uh, some of you know and some of you don't, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a medical analysis, a psychological analysis of a lot of people who've gone through what they've gone through. Just the trauma, of being accused, but then spending all the time that they spent in jail, and then they had to see some of the papers. They still did it. Right? People just did not change their mind, and I, I think that's why I hope people will take uh, Ken up on his request that we don't just say it was a very good discussion, a very powerful movie, but we're going to do something. I think that's going to be very important. Thank you. Next question. Hello. Hello. Hi. My name is Sharon Frey Witzer. I'm a criminal defense attorney, among other things. Uh, and I thought that one thing that the movie did really well was portray the degree to which you are uh, crime victims uh, to a, an equal or at least greater or, or greater extent uh, than anyone else in this story. Um, and so as crime victims, as well as uh, the uh, subjects of the criminal investigation process, I wonder if you'd be willing to speak to us about how, if you could ma wave a magic wand, you would change the process of criminal investigation to produce more reliable results or truth and protect people like yourselves as you go through the process. Okay. Well, one thing actually working on is um, from the beginning, when a teenager is picked up, right away, the film is on. They're being videotaped. Because with our case, it was 30 hours. 
our parents was not there, but it, they made it seem like our parents was right, was right next to us. So one thing would be to have the film rolling as soon as a kid is picked up, because there's a lot that goes on within those hours. Um, another thing that we advocate for is, is uh, holding these agencies accountable. Um, you know, social service, juvenile justice, you know, if, if somebody, because we understand that kids don't know their rights. We understand they don't know the law. And, and eight times out of ten, the parent doesn't know either. Um, and so, you know, like, like Ken said earlier, they come in, because you come across authority figures, your first instinct is, you know, they'll tell you, well, you didn't do nothing wrong, right? So you have nothing to worry about. And so right there, we're trying to please them and we're trying to, um, you know, we're trying to cooperate. And there needs to be somebody from these agencies there also who can, who can give a helping hand on the professional side. And I think that's something that's missing. A, a person from these agencies shouldn't come after, you know, after it's done and, and um, want to take your kid away and, and, you know, do a report on them on, on all the bad things in his life. No, it should be done before. Let's try to save some kids before they actually enter into the system. Do you know, there was a man who died last fall named George Whitmore. His obituary in the New York Times was quite interesting. He was an African-American gentleman from Queens who had gone in to help the police solve a series of crimes and ended up being convicted of these crimes. Um, he was innocent and he proclaimed his innocence and the New York uh, tabloids and newspapers went after this and sort of collectively proved to the city and the police department that this man was uh, innocent and he was exonerated and this led to Miranda. This led to the reinstatement of the death penalty in New York State. Next question. My question is much more personal. I am in awe of your strength and courage. I, I, I'm trying to get my, my head around that. Uh, 40 years ago when I was at this law school, I went to, uh, I was in voluntary offenders and I went to, to prisons to, to help uh, inmates then. How did you deal with it at 14 and 15 years old knowing that you were innocent, I, I'm, I just, and, and to come out and to survive that, I'm, I'm just in awe. I just don't know what to say. Me too. The truth, this is my, it is the truth, this is my secret. I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. You know, you put into a situation and Everything's closed around you, and you feel the only, only direction you have is to go forward. That's it. And, and that was it for us. I mean, and, you know, we came across numerous situations throughout that time in prison. You know, my mom's passed when, when I was in prison. And the only thing I knew I had to do was go forward, because I knew that somewhere there's a door there, and I got to reach it. And, and, you know, I mean, also, we were blessed. In a, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a instant, in the same process, we were blessed that we were able to come back out and, and survive that and, and, and come and talk to people and, and do the things we do. Um, and that also is, you know, for those who are, are very spiritual, is where you, you, um, you, your faith gets restored. You know, I can, um, I don't know why we went through this process. And I always tell people, I said, look, you know, if God wanted me to learn something, he could have did it a whole nother way. <laughs> we didn't have to go through this. Come on now, you the almighty. Make something quick, easy. <laughs> you know? But, but it is what it is, and, and, and we're here today. You know? Wow. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, someone was looking over us, you know, that we all came back out alive. To be quite frank, we, we came out alive. We, like Yusuf said in the film, it didn't vacate the prison term. We really went through that at 14, 15 years old. You know, we lost our youth. We lost going to the prom. We just lost being kids. I remember telling Raymond something a long time ago in 89 that, um, well, all we have is each other. So let's try to get through this together. and. Like Raymond said, it is a true blessing that we came out of this, and we're here to talk to you today. 
I know. Wow. <laughs> uh, I, I would just like to add, sir, because I've spent the last several years in awe of that same thing, the lack of bitterness, the intelligence, the wisdom, the compassion, the forbearance, the affirmation in the face of adversity that they uh, exhibit almost uh, to a man. Uh, let's remember, offered plea deals, they did not take them. Offered chance at parole, if they would admit their guilt, they did not do that. All through the place, they held true to themselves. It's an amazing thing, and, and Corey, who, who has a, a, a learning disability of some kind, and it's sort of clear, in some ways says it best and most poetically when he says, you know, hearing that, meaning Matthias Reyes's confession, he says, and all the trials and tribulations, the scuffling, the jumping on, the stabbings. Now, let us not think of this prison sentences, these prison sentences as something abstract, right? We have our images of what the hell prison must be, but in Corey's reticent, difficult, but perfect description is a sense of what they've gone through. The scufflings, the jumping ons, the stabbings, all the trials and tribulations. That says it all. And the fact that they have come out the other side, all of them, uh, with some renewed purpose is uh, a, a, a marvelous thing. I, I share your awe at that. I think it's worth saying uh, to Raymond and, and Kevin, uh, and I appreciate someone with ex your experience, that in many respects they talk a lot about what's happened since 1989, and there's very few disparaging words about lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> but the lawyers, well, I, I, but the reality is that lawyers played a very pivotal role on both sides of this case. Yes. By, by, and that's one of the biggest problems. I spent eight years as a public defender, and, and I know how tough it is uh, and how lawyers often just presume clients are guilty. You wouldn't have been arrested. You wouldn't have been denied bail. You must have done something, and they're waiting for the uh, prosecutor to prove it, and they just don't do their job. And I think this is a wake-up call. You're, you're lucky that things, that, and, and, and very fortunate that, that the person who's responsible came forward. That doesn't happen in thousands and thousands and millions exactly. of cases. Uh, and that's great, but it's also sad that no lawyer said, let me do a little extra investigation. Let me talk to another witness. Let me talk to another detective. Let me check this DNA. Let me understand these uh, original statements that were made. Why was there no recorder on for 30 hours? I mean, all of these things should have set off red lights. Uh, and it's not just an indictment of lawyers, but it's a wake-up call that yeah. we have to do something. Good, good we, we can't just simply let these things happen. Uh, and I, I'm glad that you are forgiving. I'm not, and I, I'm glad that you are, but I mean, it, it really is a remarkable thing that the lawyers didn't do much for you. We have time for just a few more questions before we have to close, yep. Yes, my name is Nate McQueen. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, I really don't have a question for you so much as I have a request for everybody else in this room. You know, I think that the tribulations, like you said, that you've gone through is enough. And one thing I thought was ridiculous in the movie is when Eckhart said, this proved that the system had passed, as if if you had been guilty, the system would not have failed. A system based off hate, a system based off punishment will never succeed. Only a system based off reinvention and rehabilitation can succeed. That's right. And that brings me to my next point, is that we sit together and we laugh and we watch this movie, but when are we truly gonna come together and fight this and say enough is enough? You know what I mean? We see this every day and a letter is not enough. No mayor is gonna change this. This is gonna come from us. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you said what you said. Uh, I just had a class today where David Simon spoke from uh, the producer and director of The Wire and, and also a former re uh, reporter for the, Boston, uh, for the uh, Baltimore Sun. Uh, and he said something very similar uh, about, you know, writing the letter is part of it, but you have to have a conscious decision that this is wrong. 
Uh, and, and you have to carry that consciousness out in terms of what you do and jury service, uh, talking to neighbors. Uh, and because there are people in this room, I'm not going to point them out, but who are saying, ah, they probably really did something, right? I mean, there are people who believe that. And uh, we I have to have. I don't think in this crowd, Jerry. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I know people in this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> you think Skip? <laughs> no, I don't think Skip. No, no. But I know people in this crowd. That, but, and the re reality is that it, you have to understand that, that how could people not be as angry and frustrated and want to take uh, some blood for what happened to them? They gave up years of their lives. We had and an I interesting think thing happened, which is uh, we were showing this film in New York in three different theaters, and we go, went to almost every, every night we go to a different screening, and we divide it up, and people would say, what can we do, what can we do? And we would always talk about the upcoming court case on December 19th, on January 19th, on February 19th, and on January 19th, so many people, New Yorkers, turned out that it flooded the, co the courtroom and they had to, it just totally shocked the prosecutors and it had, they had to move to a bigger venues. A lot of people, I had people calling me saying, I thought you, they are right, we got put in a pen for an awfully long time, you know, just sort of a holding room while the hearing went on because they couldn't take them and the system was, uh, I think, duly noted what was going on. And, and you should say something about the website. You mentioned it briefly. Yeah, well, so I'll, let, I'll let, let, let Raymond and uh, Kevin talk about that. Oh, um, well, yeah, we, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Um, there's a Central Park Five official page on Facebook. You can go on there. There's always updates. There's a website, um, which is central-park-5.com. Um, and we're always posting everything we do, whether we're, we're, you know, we're speaking, um, the court date, uh, addresses to the mayor um, we do it everything's on there so that's the best way to connect with us also if um if you want to want us to come out and speak to kids we go you know there's that and then there's also the innocence project that uh, a lot of requests go through there also. and Yusef is a master tweeter and is yeah. on Yusef yeah. Salam yeah. Uh, they all have individual Facebook pages but Yusef is, is really active in social media yeah. And we'll post these as well on the W.B. Du Bois Institute website and the uh, Charles Holman Houston uh, website as well. It was W.B. Du Bois in referring to um, Jack Johnson, who was the first African-American heavyweight champion and who, when they could find no white, great white hope to defeat him, they went back and attacked him for his personal life. And he said that Jack Johnson had done nothing that other white uh, boxers and ball players and even statesmen had done yeah, right. that is marrying other uh, women and having affairs with other women uh, it, it that there's no difference there it, it just comes down to his unforgivable blackness and I think that in many cases I'm making the same film over and over again I'm really sorry to say uh, next question is on this side yeah. this side okay oh, sorry. oh I'm sorry this side okay yeah, my, my question is kind of a follow-up on uh, what he just said, but um, I, as I think, as one of you said, you're not the first people uh, who have been wrongfully convicted, and as somebody else said, you are obviously clearly like, you know, vic yourself victims of a crime. And I'm just wondering, and, and also you made reference, I think, uh, Ken, to sort of truth and reconciliation. So my question is kind of a personal one. What would you want like I know you have a lawsuit, but what personally would you want to hear, or what do you think people who are wrongfully convicted, um, what would make that better? Do, do you understand what I'm trying to ask you? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's far-fetched to ask for an apology, because you know, people become so arrogant and, and invested in their mistakes that they don't want to apologize. And so, just make it right. At the end of the day, you have an opportunity, you have a chance to fix it. Just make it right. Um, we're not sitting here debating about the money. We're not, you know, we just, just let's, let's just finish it. Let's end it. That's all we want to do. We want to just get to a point where we can finally put one foot in front of the other and move forward and pick up the pieces and, and go. That's it. That's and what, what would that look like? What would making it right look like to you? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to put no price on it. I don't want to force nobody's hand to apologize. Let's sit down and just finish it. That's it. Whatever the conclusion is, let's finish it. You know, um, and um, because there's a lot of other issues out there that needs that we that we need to look at. You know, Central Park Five is one out of a million, and we want to just close this chapter of the Central Park Five and go on and fight something else. 
you know, we have a lot of other issues that need to be attended to. I, I think that's right for us. We're not engaged, it, as I said before. I just think putting a big fat period at the end of this run-on sentence is what needs to be done, and and that will come in whatever form. But what Raymond alludes to is this is this irresponsible, to my mind, lack of willingness to engage even in the conversation. That the delay of even getting to a trial and the insistence that it going to trial, when in nine times out of ten, in a room full of lawyers you know this would have been mediated and settled in some way, but the inability to say I'm sorry, the inability to at least accept responsibility for things done, you have policemen still believing that they acted in good faith to keep a 14-year-old under intense interrogation for 30 hours without food or water or anything else and then videotaped a coerced confession is acting in good faith. Police. <laughs> Josie, next question. Oh, okay. Um, so, this is obviously the law school, and um, you, there are a lot of people here, a lot of students, I'm in my third year being one of them, who are interested in criminal defense and criminal justice reform, um, and don't, either don't have a job, that would be me, but also don't know where they're um, best u utilized. I mean, part of the problem is going and becoming a public defender, you're working in a system that doesn't work and you're working under laws that don't work, and you're working every day very hard, just as hard as you can, watching people get convicted and sent to jail. And working in reform, you're not always working directly with people and communities, and you're sort of running into the bureaucracy. And, and I think that a lot of us struggle with where, you know, we've been so blessed. You guys talk about how blessed you've been. We've been so lucky to even be here. Where, um, where do you, Think that we're best utilized. Where would you Where would you put us? In okay. Can I answer? Can I just begin for one second, Josie? Because um, you're not a parent yet, and when you're a parent, you suddenly understand that it's not black and white, that it's all these shades of gray, and that we live in a university in abstraction and sort of idealization. And uh, the real world has, and I don't mean to say that in any kind of you know, uh, patronizing way to you, you know the real world as well as I do, um, but the real world has uh, so many accommodations and so many compromises and so many shades of gray that um, you just do what you can do. And I always feel that you, you've got kind of two obligations to yourself. One is Socratic, that is who am I? Who am I? What do I have to say? The question you're asking, right? Uh, we won't ever answer that for you. But you can expose yourself in a great university to the, the brains and the mentors and the ideas that make that perhaps possible. Who am I? And then you're required to persevere. Uh, that is to say, no path will be easy. Certainly, the five show you that. And that from that, you've got something. And that it will, you know, it will not always be easy going along, but, but you know, Franklin Roosevelt said it was the, in his last inaugural, just frail and just weeks away from death, that, that, that the road of civilization was a rising road. And that, uh, you know, it just be, it becomes your decision to decide what part of that lifting process you're gonna be uh, engaged in. Other comments? Any other? No, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Final two questions here and there. Yep. Okay. Um, piggybacking upon her comment, I, I first want to say uh, I'd like to apologize to you gentlemen, and here's why. When you were going through your trials and tribulations, I had come out of law school four years earlier. So I was that person who shouldn't have let you have ineffective counsel. I was that person who was down in D.C. where Tree was <laughs> doing his public defender work, who I was up here in Boston working in a law firm thinking I was doing the right thing for me and my family, when the truth of the matter is we saw those kinds of things happening on a daily basis. So to you, from people such as myself and those in the audience who I know were more responsible than even myself, we should have been there for you. And for that reason, I apologize. <laughs> Secondly, I'll say very quickly, we here in Boston are no strangers to this. 
because we had a situation with the Charles Stewart, Charles Stewart. where we allowed, and I don't want to say allowed as though we allowed, but we allowed because we didn't do anything about it. We systemically allowed police to go into minority neighborhoods and frisk people and have their pants down when the truth of the matter is there were those of us who were attorneys and not attorneys and just everyday walking folks who said there's something not right about that situation. And every time we go to bed saying there's something just not right and we close our eyes and we go to sleep and we get up the next morning and we put on our nice suits and ties and we allow it to happen, we apologize not only to you two but to the countless other people out there people out there who are going through the same experience. So for those two apologies, I'll say that. But I also want to say, I just am so pleased because when you talk about those people who are advocates, there are some damn good people out there yep. who really do care. Yeah. The system itself, I'm, I'm listening because uh, Judge Sotomayor and Judge Breyer are fighting right now in the Supreme Court fighting because prosecutors are doing what they should not be doing. They are using race to solve, to, to get convictions where they absolutely, where prosecutors themselves have come with this handbook that says we will not overstep these boundaries. But of course they do because in the heat of battle we want to win. For those reasons we realize where we need to step up is at the Supreme Court level. It's not necessarily a letter to the mayor, but we need to let people understand. We recognize it, we don't appreciate it, and if our system is going to fix itself, it has to fix ourselves from the top down. Because the Supreme Court is allowing some of these non-videotaped confessions to go forward. They're stepping back saying, well, we think it's okay in a five to four decision. Yeah. We're saying, well, maybe next time we'll take a look at it. We know better, we have to do better. Thank you. Let me just say this as we have to end. Uh, uh, Betty Vornberg is here. She said, why are you leaving so early, Charles? Uh, her husband was the former dean here, Jim Vornberg, who brought me to Harvard in the 1980s. Uh, and I remember uh, an article he wrote as a former prosecutor about decent restraint uh, of prosecutors. The whole idea is how to use discretion. And it reminds me, for those of you who don't know, if you look at our website on March 27th, which is just uh, two weeks uh, away, we're going to have a discussion of the case, uh, the Schwartz case. Remember the case of the young person who did a lot on technology and was prosecuted here in Massachusetts uh, and committed suicide. So we're going to have a discussion uh, about that, the scales of justice, what that really means with the former prosecutors and people who are concerned about technology. The whole idea is to push the envelope to make sure that people can look at those issues as well. I, I think that uh, what, what, what people can do and should do is not only start the dialogue uh, of trying to support what's happened here, but you know we need to have a mass uh, appearance. Of when is the next court hearing? We need to be there. We need to tell our folks. We need to tweet uh, and use blogs and everything else to let folks know who are in New York to go to the courthouse. April 16th PBS broadcast. And watch the April 16th PBS bro broadcast with your friends and your enemies uh, to have them see this because no one ex understands what it's really all about. Uh, and they come in with skepticism and then to have that large discussion uh, as we go forward. These gentlemen have uh, a train to catch. They come, they come all the way from New York and they're going all the way back tonight. So please thank them all for being a part of it tonight.